All right. Hi, everybody. It's our CFB Talk 137. It is Tuesday night. This is when we like to talk to you about whatever you want to talk about in college football. My name is Bob Akhairi. As we all know, the draft is now behind us. We're kind of in another lull before things get exciting again, especially around the summertime. But there's still stuff going on. It's college football offseason, and it, it each year that passes, it seems to become more of a, a all-year-round event, especially with things like NIL, the portal, and whatever on earth Deion Sanders is doing at Colorado. We've got material for days here, so it's wonderful. But again, so if you'd like to join us, just hit request. Otherwise, I'll happily just sort of meander through some of the topics of the week. I mean, just kind of going back to the NFL draft that is right behind us. It looks like my friend Thack would like to join us. I'm going to go ahead and add him. But unsurprisingly, the SEC led the conferences and the total players drafted for the 17th straight time. So 62 for the SEC, followed by the Big Ten. Maybe they'll start to get a little closer together, especially when USC and UCLA join the Big Ten. Of course, the SEC has Oklahoma and Texas joining, so that'll add some numbers there. But no surprises there. I guess, you know, what can you say? The NFL likes to get talent from teams that have a habit of succeeding and winning championships. But, Thack, how are you today? Man, I'm doing wonderful. Uh, enjoyed a little bit of the draft, even though uh, my disdain for the NFL, obviously, uh uh, it's an interesting one, uh, I would say. Uh, a couple of notable SEC uh, 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 rises and falls. Uh, Anthony Richardson, of course, picked at four, going to the Colts. Uh, Levis dropping to the second round. Uh, any surprises there uh, in the draft uh, as you as you watch, Bob? <laughs> you know, l- watching poor Levis to fall was kind of one of those sad moments. There's always that guy who kind of – you know, has a lot of hype going in, and then you just see them drop and go down. And and each time the shot goes back to him and his, like, you know, draft group, you, you kind of feel – your heart kind of drop, feels a little bad for him because it's so awkward, you know. But, I mean, it's not like they do their best to kind of guess who's going to go in that first round. I wasn't um, – I wasn't entirely shocked to see – uh, the fourth round pick that I thought made sense. Cause again, everyone seems to see the talent that we talked about it last week, but a lot of folks saw some talent there that, um, you know, that may not have shown up on the field, but, but Anthony Richardson just seemed to, to wow scouts in general. So I wasn't too shocked to see him go to the Colts. How about yourself that what, what surprised you? Uh, man, I, I don't know. I, the Richardson thing definitely, uh, it, I, it didn't surprise me, but, uh, again, as, as, as well as everybody who watched the previous college football season, I don't, I don't quite get, uh, of course, uh, I think I saw a statistic, um, saying, uh, that, uh, uh, nobody with a completion, uh, uh, percentage that, uh, that, that, uh, Richardson had that, uh, past season has ever really made it in the NFL. Uh, obviously he's a real athletic guy, but the, uh, the completion percentage and that kind of stuff leads, uh, a little bit to be desired. So I, I'm wondering what, uh, what can happen, but I mean, it's the NFL and it's anybody's game. The other, the other big story that I'm really, really following right now is what is going on at Alabama. Um, and, and over this past week, uh, Tyler, Buchner, I believe is his name, Notre Dame quarterback, actually now backup quarterback, ex-backup quarterback, I guess, at Notre Dame, committing to the University of Alabama in the transfer portal. Uh, Notably, a little rocky season uh, with losses to Marshall, of course, uh, uh, and I believe an injury had put him... uh, put him behind but he's joining his ex-offensive coordinator uh at alabama and people are people are saying that uh you know uh, saban may have lost it others are saying that saban may be trying to revert to the aj mccarran years of sort of mediocre quarterback elite talent but the problem is it's you know obviously it's a it's a team that has a bunch of depth but nobody uh, crazy stands out in terms of the amount of ridiculous talent that they would have to have to support uh, a quarterback that they might not like. And, uh, you know, it, it also goes back to the development uh, thing. If they weren't able to develop a quarterback in that time, 
you know, it, people are starting to question what's what's going on at Alabama. And, you know, I, I think they'll probably be fine. Uh, yeah, I, I think they're going to be fine. That's like walking into just a toy land of of incredible recruits. I mean, I wonder how much that Sam Hartman transfer has to do with that. Because obviously Hart, Sam Hartman did great at Wake Forest. He did look good in the spring game. He goes over there, and granted, I've, I've heard some people wondering, well, now what is he thinking now that the guy who recruited him to Notre Dame is now going? Uh, the coach, the position coach is now over at uh, Alabama, but I think certainly that that relationship there, I think probably had a lot to do with it. I wouldn't be surprised because I think Tyler Butcher then going over to Alabama, I'm sure. I mean, you know, Nick Saban's famous for trusting to some extent the uh, the quality of, of, you know, when it comes to recruiting, he always obviously wants to recruit to be the best, but he, he trusts the analysis of his of his uh, uh, assistants and all of that. So I could see like, Hey, this guy's going to be, this guy's going to be good. And I mean, you know, in a pinch when you've got a new offensive coordinator and you just, you know, lost. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, the number one draft pick, you know, and a reigning Heisman for me, uh, well, not technically reigning. I don't, I I guess your second year, no longer reigning after that, but I mean, but you know, Heisman winning quarterback, I think that was a good, I mean, it seems like it could be a safe call at the very least. So maybe that's what they're going for. Someone who their offensive coordinator knows, feels comfortable with. And, you know, Notre Dame's a fine school, but it's Alabama still Alabama. And throwing them in that talent pool, who knows? He may, he may rise up to it. You know, we have someone else who wants to join in the conversation. I want to let him up. Uh, Cajun Killer 94 I'm going to go ahead and add you and just feel free. Um, once you jump into <laughs> do the time jump, you can, you can chime in. Yeah, and, and I like Buchner too. I think he's a solid, solid guy. So, check one, two, check one, two. Can you hear me? We can hear you. What's going on? Hey, I have a quick question. We all know the Cajuns got one draft pick, seventh round to Washington. Do you count Osiris Tyrus as a Cajun draftee? He spent two of his three years at UL before getting poached over to Florida this past year. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, LSU had more than one pick. I mean, didn't they have six? No, no, uh, UL, UL. Oh, UL. oh, my goodness. I am so sorry. I completely – boy, I was just like, wait, wait. Did I, I, <laughs> that's, on not, that's on me. That's on me. Oh, no, 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 no. I because it's like we've talked about Louisiana with you before. I, I do remember that, but I mean, yeah. so are you asking if he counts or wait? I'm sorry, which player? If I apologize. Osiris, I told if Osiris Tyrus, the Buffalo Bills, I think second rounder, the O lineman, does he count as a Cajun draftee? Oh, if that's always. Went- Sorry, I cut you off. Keep going. Freshman and sophomore year was at UL before moving with the coach to Florida this past year. Yeah, that's a that's I think one of those timeless questions. Only because I'm thinking right now. I mean, if we want to go even to the first round, I mean, does Pittsburgh still claim Jordan Addison? Because I mean, that's where he made his big splash. You know, he won the top receiver in the country playing at Pittsburgh but of course he spent that last year at USC catching passes from Caleb Williams did that make a huge difference in his draftability I don't know I mean he was still already an attractive player before but I mean it would be interesting that that's I think that's one of those questions that um it's good it's good fodder I mean because I I I get exactly what you're saying here you know I mean he develops himself becomes an attractive player as you said at Louisiana and goes to Florida for that one year and then gets drafted. I think in that situation, I have to say, I mean, the Pittsburgh to USC route, I mean, Pittsburgh isn't quite the same level at USC, but it's still an FBS program that, you know, its history is one titles, all that stuff. But it is a bit of a jump to go from the Raging Cajuns to the Gators. And, and even on a pretty miserable Gators squad that we just saw, and we we're just talking about that because obviously the quarterback <laughs> Was a big surprise to see going the in the fourth. Pardon me, the the fourth overall pick. Um, I think you have to give some credit though to being on that Florida offense and getting the eyeballs on you, which may not have been there, you know, playing against you know playing in the Sun Belt, especially 
going through a, an SEC schedule, then you really – because, I mean, we were just talking about that. The SEC, you know, 17th year in a row where they get the most NFL draft picks. So you're seeing, you know, Osiris Torrance compete against guys who are probably going in the league with him on a week-to-week basis. So that probably helped him. Now, all of that said, certainly, certainly there have been guys – who've been in the G5, who've made their draft, who've been able to get in that first round, or even um, even FCS guys have made in the first round, just based on pure talent and all of that stuff. So I'm sure, though, they sat down and kind of worked that out. I mean, heck, I mean, I, I just forgot, like, earlier in the second round, North Dakota State had an offensive guard drafted as well. So, I mean, it's possible, you're right, it's possible he could have just stayed at Louisiana and a kind of a Maybe that no. connection going with his coordinator and all that stuff certainly helped. I mean, you know, he knows Billy Napier, so, I mean, that certainly couldn't have hurt much as well. Yeah. Now, we should have had a second draft pick with Michael Jefferson, but with, with that wreck in early April, are you surprised no one tried picking him up as a uh, UFA? I am, but I wonder what they're seeing. I, I don't know enough about the, his health situation. And a lot of those guys, it's a cold equation. So I'm wondering what they're seeing. So that all of that said, there's certainly a precedent for a guy in that situation to be able to get himself back into. Yeah, because he was projected, what, third, fourth round? Yeah. And, you know, that it kind of the, this kind of I mean, I don't mind. I don't want to just dive into a different topic, but it kind of reminds me why I'm a big fan of the NIL, the like all of the possible ways these guys can get paid, because you look, that's isn't that a great example of it. You know, I mean, something goes wrong and then, you know, it, it, it's it's terrible. So, yeah. So, yeah, no, I mean, but I mean, I hope he gets a full recovery and can kind of work his way back into it. There's certainly opportunities for it. Um, it wouldn't but, be without precedent to have a guy who, who kind of has an unfortunate issue like that, a medical issue like that, then kind of get their way back into into the league. I hope he does um, because it's a shame for that sort of thing. Now, I am going to count this. Reese Burns, opponent of UL, got drafted today by Montreal. Yes, I'm I was actually it. looking at the I'm CFL draft it. right now. <laughs> yeah why not i mean you know i mean they, i love the canadian the cfl draft because they've got like two drafts they've got parallel drafts one's like the global draft and then one is the you're either born in canada or there's like someone related to you from canada really close to you like your mom and then you can go so it was really funny like i was looking at who the like <laughs> one of these guys like he got drafted because they decided to classify him as a canadian because his mom was from canada and so, therefore, he Not qualified deep. for, like, the domestic draft, which sounds like a beer. But, you know, anyway, it, it's uh, – <laughs> I love, Not I only love that. the CFL draft, man. It is so funny. And you get to see all these players you didn't know were Canadian suddenly get drafted in there. I mean, like, Dante Bull, you know, Fresno State's offensive lineman, who was a good offensive lineman, he was, like, you know, the number one draft pick uh, for the Ottawa Red Blacks out there. So, yeah, I always get a kick out of that every year. The New Orleans Saints – UDSA'd a punter. But it's not a guaranteed deal because he got drafted by Hamilton. He's Australian, but he has a house in Canada. Where would you go if you was him? I'd go wherever paid me at that point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, hey, you know, there's those guys that go to Japan and play college football there. We've been interviewed some of their reporters it's like they're merciless to their import players though like i didn't realize that until we talked to guys who had played there and they're like no they'll bring you over you know you were maybe a good decent d1 player but the moment you don't produce like right after the game they'll just cut you and i'm like oh my god that's brutal <laughs> you know it's like but they've got like four spots so it's like there's there's any number of talented you know, former NCAA players that are willing to just, you know, hop on a plane and ride over to Japan and get some get some reps. And, you know, we've got a couple other people I want to let up here. I just want to kind of go in some order here. Uh, I'm going to yeah, let, up... let me go. Great, <laughs> great talk to you again. Great talking to you, Matt. Thank you. Let's see here. Ryan okay. Gunter, I'm going to go ahead and let you up and then I'm going to get to um, I'm going to get to whoever I can next. So I apologize. I just saw there was a. Uh, 
Pigskin Pete, if you come up again, I'll let you up, but no problem. Hey, Ryan, what's up? Go ahead and unmute. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I do have uh, another question about a Louisiana uh, school. Um, I'd like to, you know, a player particularly. Um, uh, you know, the only one that matters, by the way, I heard a lot of UL. It's actually ULL talk. Um, just want to point that out. Uh, Lafayette ain't doing very much over there. Just want to point that out to our friend. But uh, Keyshawn Butte, top 10, you know, pro- uh, projected to start the year, has a down year. And, you know, a lot goes on, down performance, really doesn't test well in the combine. And goes 121, you know, in the late in the six to the Patriots. I haven't seen somebody in the draft go that far. I mean, what a fall. Uh, that's non-injury related. I just want to get your thoughts on that. I just I think it's so strange, honestly. And just uh, he really didn't do very much, I will say. You know, he did falter a good bit. Yeah, when you get those kind of drops, it is absolutely stunning, you know, because he I remember like he was one of the top receivers for uh at least in some of those seasons, you know, um uh for the for the Tigers. So to see that kind of a drop, I mean, we were having this kind of conversation about, you know, was that going to also affect um, C.J. Stroud because he didn't do well on the test? So sometimes that ended up being, you know, yeah, he didn't go in. Yeah, he went number two. So, I mean, it wasn't it didn't really affect his draft, you know, his draft standing at all. But uh, I'm not, you know, when when the guy drops that much for non, you know, athletic reasons, it's just like, what did. What did he say to the, in the interview? Right. Like, you know, there's that rumor about the whole SEC before the SEC championship game. If you don't know about that, go look into that. I don't know if that's true, but he, you know, he was going to return to LSU. Um, and then he abruptly decided to go to the draft and he tested poorly. You know, I just thought it was one of those, I haven't seen that in a while. It's obviously happened before where somebody has. You know, just didn't you know work out. Maybe they had their projections wrong or whatnot. But uh, it's definitely something I haven't seen in a good bit. Um, but I just thought it was really strange. Yeah, the other thing that kind of strikes me too is like I always wonder how much. Yeah, you, know, you go. There's there's a couple of things that could be at play. Maybe there's some things involving you know how he's doing. You know, after he had a surgery and all of that stuff back, that, you know, a few seasons ago and, and just his physical health that, that spooked him a little bit. Or maybe, yeah, just maybe the way they I care. I wonder, I assume a lot of the uh, the folks who do these interviews, the interview portion of the NFL kind of scouting may have been really direct with him about some of the things, you know, like that rumor you're talking about. I, I remember it, um, you know, but at the same time, like, how did he handle it? Like, I mean, right. is he a person that sounded like, OK, this is a guy who, who's never going to do that again? Or is this like, a, you know, was he kind of laughing and snorting and kind of like, well, you know, like, uh, I have no yeah. idea. Like, I'm this is such pure speculation. But I know if I were like, if you're the NFL and you're throwing millions of dollars at these guys, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's tough. I mean, CJ Stroud, you know, I'm sure he interviewed well. I'm not saying that. But I mean, you know, we know he didn't do well on, on that test for, you know, yeah. I don't know if it's cognition, but he probably still interviewed really well enough that they're like, still willing to burn the second pick on him. And I'm not saying burn the God, you know, who knows? He could be a superstar. So clearly he was able to make up for something while Butte is kind of like, what did he say? Or what, what happened? Cause right. And will we ever know? We maybe we'll know. And like, if he, once he's out of the, if he, especially if gosh, I hope he doesn't, but you know, I never wish that on anybody, but if he like burns out of the league, we're going to hear like, Oh man. So let's talk about what happened. Yeah. Like I was, you know, this is the real like kind of reason. I mean, he was also, you know, for what it's worth and I'll end on this and I'll jump out. He was also one of the first college football players I've seen really ever just off my memory where, you know, he sat out a game. It was a very low non-conference game. I forgot who was against. It was against kind of a nobody, but he was the first person that got excused to play to go to the birth of his child, which I think that's amazing. That's a very big, important time in your life. But that was the first time I've seen on a college level someone be excused, you know, to do that at a, you know, a program that's, you know, in the SEC. I thought that was strange, too. It just – his whole last year was just very interesting, you know. But Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to just say as a dad, I kind of respect that. But at the same time, yeah, no, that's uh, – oof, man. Yeah. So – but thanks for bringing him up. That yeah. that that is one of the, the the more interesting stories of the draft, and I, it, it's fun to kind of to speculate. And maybe one day we'll find out. But uh, 
Whatever he did, don't do that if you're in a position to be drafted by an NFL team. You got to sure get it going. All right, man. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. Hey, let's see here. I'm going to let up um, John. Uh, and then after that, we'll get to our friend, Coach Clark. Hey, John, what's going on? Hey, how you doing, man? It's been a minute. Yeah, absolutely. How are things with you? Hey, not too bad. Not too bad. Hope everything is good with you, too. Hey, um, question I have for you tonight. I know um, as of July, we're going to get a huge reshuffle on a lot of college football, you know, just teams moving to new conferences, uh, you know, teams moving up from the from AA up to up to uh, conference. Yeah, we get two new ones speak from that, Jacksonville State and Sam Houston. Yeah, I, I guess my question for tonight is I'm curious, if, do you think we, we're going to have any more moves? I, I, was, you know, I think most likely yes, but I'm kind of curious what your opinion of who you, if someone does move, who, who is it going to be and where do they go? I love that question because I was just, as I was kind of prepping for the show, I'm like, are we, uh, should we wait till the end of June again? And then we're just going to get some sudden surprise like last year with USC and UCLA or another surprise. Although and it was, wasn't as an abrupt a surprise. We had more of a dragged out. Are they really about to do this with Texas and Oklahoma the year before? Is it going to be something like that? I, the more I thought about it, the more I'm a little hesitant because I don't know. There's a couple of factors in play. I think it, we're waiting to see between the damn Pac-12 and Big 12. Is one of them going to make a move? I'll, actually, let me step back. I don't think the Big 10 or the SEC are going to do anything. I, I think if the Big 10 does anything, it's a reactionary move to some total implosion going on between probably the Pac-12 um, and imploding <laughs> and the, and the big 12. But I think those, the two giants right now are not going to be doing anything. If there's any moves, it's going to happen because the long awaited knife fight between the big 12 and the pac 12 has finally erupted and, and blood is on the floor. And we're trying to figure out which, <laughs> which team's <laughs> been carved out and where they're going to land. But, uh, you know, the big 12, uh, you know, I could, I think we're going to wait to see a couple of things. Once the pac 12 figures out what the hell that media deal is going to be. Um, then we'll see how you know cogent they're going to be if they're going to stick together. Because certainly we've talked about it before. Just last week again, you know, San Diego State and Southern uh, Southern Methodist Southern Methodist. Oh, pardon me, SMU look like they'd be two teams that they would like to add to kind of broaden that footprint, get that TV market set that the Pac-12 you know trying to replace with Southern California, losing those two teams, and get you know into the Metroplex and get into Texas. But if that falls apart, I could see the Big 12. They bounce. I mean, the Big 12, I mean, I don't know if some of you guys caught this in the last, you know, 24 hours or so of the news cycle, but they announced, you know, Brett Yormark, who I've talked about how much I admire his kind of uh, chutzpah, you know, his willingness to try crazy things. They have said they want to start playing a game or two a year in Mexico, um, which isn't that crazy? I'm sure you all know how well NFL Mexico does. It does in Mexico itself. I think they want to play basketball games down in uh, Mexico City and football games in Monterrey, which is another major city. And actually, it's the football hotbed of Mexico, um, at least in their college football scene. So that would actually be kind of a fit. And they have some some stadiums that could certainly compete in terms of that. Um, so, I mean, they, so when I'm looking at the two conferences, you have the Pac-12 where all they seem to do is talk about, oh, we're going to have a media deal. No, we're not. No, yes, we are. Oh, it's going to involve Amazon. Oh, it's going to involve Apple. Oh, it might involve, you know, who knows? We're gonna they're gonna invent something that we've never heard of before. We're gonna like find out somehow, you know, <laughs> it's been maybe it'll be it'll merge with the uh, uh, WWE and and uh, <laughs> or <the laughs> UFC or something. Who knows? But then the Big Twelve sounds a little bit more like they have together. But I think so. If any moves, that's a really long winded way to say. I think if we see moves, it's gonna be between those two conferences either adding teams to the Pac-12 and then the ripple effect that would have at the lower division, probably at the G5 programs and the G5 conferences trying to shuffle again. Um, or will we might not see anything. I'm really, I wouldn't be, sh I, as crazy as it is, like a year ago, or not a year ago, but a little less than a year ago, at the end of last season, I think we we're all waiting for some crazy shuffle to happen. It hasn't happened yet. And now I'm wondering, will we see anything? Because the other factor in all of this is just, Quite frankly, when the CFP expanded, and I mean today we got the uh, we got the official like dates for how they're planning to break down the uh, 
the multiple rounds. Like they've got the first rounds on campus. They're going to be on like December 20th and 21st. The quarterfinals going to be the New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Semifinals when the championship game used to be. Um, this is not this season. Next, though, it's going to be the 2024, 25 season. Um, and then the national championship is now going to be on Monday, uh, January 20th, or the close to that in the next two seasons. So anyways, the reason I mention all of that is now we have more spots available. So it's plausible. One of the big questions was whether or not, you know, it, it's, it's access to getting into the, the playoff con the playoff scene. So more conferences have access to it. So now the desire to just hop, jump ship and get into the big 10 and sec beyond the money, which is extremely important, isn't quite as, as compelling. So it could be that you could still stay in the PAC 12, big 12, American and, and any of the G5s still now have a shot at getting into the table and at least having a way to fight your way into the title game. But um, no, it's a good question. And I, I apologize for how long winded that is because it's something I was really thinking about before we started this talk. And, and I'm, I could, I think that's the possible scenario, but each week that passes, I'm, I'm hesitant. If we get, pa if we get past July 4th, I would be shocked. I think July 4th is like the ultimate cutoff date. I think that'll be when we'll know for sure if things are just going to stay the way they are for the upcoming season. And then who knows, things could start to blow apart as soon as the regular season begins. How about you, John? What are you thinking? Sorry, I just... Uh, no, 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 no. I, pre I appreciate your answer. Um, yeah, I I'm thinking really it could be in a lot of possibilities. Like you said, I think it really comes down to what the Pac-12 does with uh, its media deal. Um, and I think, you know, depending on what the money's going to look like and, or not look like, I think it could definitely influence where uh, teams might go or... Uh, to the conference. Um, I'm very curious what happens to, you know, I, I, I think in this, in this scenario, if teams keep picking from the G5 conferences, I mean, just, I mean, we look at conference USA and look at how, what, what state it's in at the moment. I, it's hard to tell, look at, you know, be a sustainable model unless going up from, from, uh, from F from FCS, how, every G5 conference is supposed to survive in this scenario if teams keep pulling up and keep pulling up to the inevitable 16, 18 team conferences. I'm just curious of what happens to what, uh, you know, eventually what happens to G5 conferences at this point. Do they keep pulling up from FCS and keep hoping teams want to move up? Or they, uh, or inevitably, you know, does one conference fall and, and it's just sort of like a WCC situation. Oh, I, I agree with you there. And, and conference USA seems to be the weakest of them at the moment. After that reshuffle, I thought the Sun Belt of the G5 came out the strongest in the last uh, conference shuffle, and Conference USA um, certainly seemed the shakiest. And I mean, it, it isn't it isn't great when you have to grab you know a, a couple of teams from the FCS to come and join you, which we have now with Jacksonville State, which is a great team. And now, hey, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, Rich Rod is now going to be coaching at FBS again with them, and then obviously Sam Houston, which is is a long time. A solid, you know, FCS program is going to be also joining them there too. But I, I wonder if that's what they'll do because I remember we spent a bit of the off season last year, or even during the season, wondering would they start to look to even perhaps a Florida A and M or a program like that to kind of um, sort of strengthen that conference if it were to happen. But meanwhile, looking at the Big Twelve, I mean, how exciting would it be to see like I, I'm. They, they have some opportunities there. I, I wouldn't mind seeing like <laughs> the idea of watching like BYU in Houston playing in Monterey, Mexico is just again, I, we'll see where it goes. I, I, I hope they do what they're saying. But I mean, they went through and said that they want to play occasional games in Mexico. And uh, that one that one could be interesting for sure. Um, but, John, thanks for joining us. You know, we're starting to slow down, but I want to let Coach Clark up because I know last week we weren't able to get him up here. Of course. Um, yeah, thanks again, man. Yeah, absolutely, John. Thanks for joining in. Hey, Coach Clark, how are you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. I uh, I just got out of a meeting at uh, practice number seven of spring ball today, or as we say in in Monmouth, uh, second winter ball. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> love it. Well, no, it, it actually the first few days was miserable, but it just got sunny all of them. You know, it's like uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, uh, you know what? Second breakfast. Hey, Oregon, what? It's time for spring. Uh, what about winter? You've already had it. Oh, we've had one. Yes. What about second winter? My friend, I live in Minnesota. Yeah. It snowed like two days ago. It never ends here. Like it's going to be like 60 or 70 
this week. But no, winter winter never ends. Winter winter is here, and it'll never end until it maybe for a few months, and then we go into into well, actually, fall weather here is lovely for football. It's actually wonderful. But um, but yeah, no, this is this was a winter that never ended up here. So I hear you, um, <laughs> out on the Pacific finally Coast. Finally, had some finally had some sunshine. Yeah. Um, but uh. You know, if anyone go on talking about that whole playoff thing, I think it's going to stabilize college football. The NI, the craziness from all the NIL stuff, the TV contracts, the super conferences. Everyone, I think of super conferences the same way I think of super teams in the NBA. It's not much fun to watch, <laughs> you know. Uh, but really, you know, I mean, I looked at the AP poll era, and nobody liked the writers picking the national championship, and I get that. The one thing I said is that the odds were a bit even. You'd see a lot, that, you know, given that there were six power conferences in, back in those days with the Southwest, um, you know, thanks Southern Methodist. Um, but uh, also you saw teams in, in, you know, the conferences were smaller. There were more of them. There were a lot more independent schools, and you'd see schools like, you know, get a shot at the title like you see BYU uh Boston College and BYU in the top in the top five you know you know 1984 national champions uh you know for one uh you know like schools like Rice and Houston they were in a they were in a power conference in those days and so I'm hoping that's kind of what the what the what the playoff does is it evens up the odds we get to see you know Coastal Carolina and BYU upset teams like you know uh like you know, your traditional powerhouses like Ohio State and, uh, and you know, Florida, Florida State and stuff like that. Absolutely. You know, you, you reminded me of a conversation I had, gosh, it was before the pandemic. Cause it was when Rocky Long was at San Diego State. Uh, went to Mountain West Media Day a couple of years in a row. And he was always a fun guy to interview because he – he was truly an old school football coach and attitude. Like he was talking to someone from a different era in the sense that it was the, the, the old general kind of like just, just respect, not like the, the more player friendly coaches. It was so funny too. Cause then you, you talk to some of the other younger coaches and they'd be like, Hey, you're like my buddy. And you talk to him. It's like, Oh wow. It's dad. You know I mean? Or I don't even know how to phrase it, but the Rocky Long said this one thing because we was asking him about the playoff and he was not a fan of the, the 14 playoff and he wanted to see it expanded. But the way he phrased it was great. He's like, look, it could be that year after year, the G5 team that gets a shot just gets destroyed. And then, you know, fine, they got their shot. No one's going to complain. But he's like, there's going to be a year where one of those teams somehow makes it all the way, at least to the title game. And people are going to lose their mind. And in a good way, they're going to lose their minds. And the ratings are going to go off the roof for casual fans who wouldn't be necessarily as passionate. I mean, we saw a bit of that this last season. I mean, granted, TCU then hit the uh, the brick wall that was uh, the Georgia Bulldogs. But, I mean, up until that yeah. point, man, were they excited to watch. Um, and, the, and I think to some extent that helped quite a bit. And then, like, with the era of the, of the transfer portal and the NIL stuff, for one, I got to get on some of that money. I think I drink enough liquid death. You know, and I'll go halvesies with any of those battleship museums if they want to do something. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, when they're this craziness with the with the you know the three ring circus that is the transfer portal and the NIL stuff, you know, and you know players making more money than the entire coaching staff, it's going to even level out the playing field. Why are you going to want to go ride pine for three or you know your your three years or maybe your entire career at an, at the SEC when you could go to Coastal Carolina, Georgia Southern? you know, Boston College, somewhere like that, and be a four-year starter, you know, or, uh, you know, or, you know, go go for some school, go play at some school in the Mountain West, because you know you're going to get as much opportunity as somebody in the Pac-12 or, you know, or in the SEC to go to that final game. And it's going to probably keep, you know, all these teams that want to bolt for a conference where they don't fit all of a sudden. It's going to keep them home. I think, I think it'll, you know, after a few years of getting the crap kicked out of them, I think USC and UCLA are probably one are going to go back, uh, back, back to the back to the West Coast. Oh, I don't know. Unless they can come up with a pretty big cash offer uh, year after year, I'm not sure, but we'll see about that. You know, I want to slowly start wrapping us up, but I see Pigskin Pete came back up, so I just want to give him a chance to just join in before we start slowly wrapping this up. Hey, uh, Pigskin Pete, uh, feel free to unmute. would love to hear from you as well. Hey, thanks. I wanted to see um, – yeah, I, agree, I agree too. I don't, money's where – money talks, you know. 
I'm a I'm a Syracuse fan, so we moved to the ACC, of which we're the doormat now. Um, but money talks. Um, I'd much rather be a second tier, um, you know, conference Big East, but kind of be up upper echelon, upper third of that conference than the Vanderbilt, so to speak, of the ACC. But I digress. I, I agree with your point. Hey, um, yeah. I had a question on AR, um, Anthony Richardson. Um, what do you think of his potential as a pro? Ooh, we've been having some fun with that. And I know Thack and I have differing thoughts. You know, Thack, I just want to let you back up again. I know you're up here. I'd love to hear you unmute and give your thoughts on that one real quick. The the Richardson or uh, or uh, staying at or uh, not being a doormat of a con. Oh, no, Richardson. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Well, I was agreeing also with Pig there. I, I think uh, I catch a lot of flack with Missouri fans, Pig. I'm a, I'm a Mizzou fan, and I catch a lot of flack with them because I'd, I'd rather yeah. be in the Big 12. But uh, Richardson's interesting, man. And, and um, I, I read a stat. I, I said this a little bit earlier in the show, and I read a stat that somebody had posted, and uh, it, it was something along the lines of somebody with Richardson's college completion percentage has never – uh, never quote really made it, meaning started or or ended up ha- uh, having a having a decent season that lasted longer a year in the NFL, which I thought was interesting. Uh, definitely the athletic abilities there, but uh, but uh, he, he's definitely got some uh, completion issues, and it, it didn't make a lot of sense for me. And I know Bob uh, has a little bit of a differing opinion, but I, I agree with him in the sense that it's you never know. I mean, I I'm from St. Louis and. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kurt Warner, I, I think I said this last week, uh, they, he was stocking groceries and he was a D2 quarterback at uh, UNI <laughs> before he won a Super Bowl and now he's in the Hall of Fame. So what do yeah. I know? Yeah, you know, I mean, and my only thought is like, I, I just, I put some faith in how much money they spend on analyzing these guys. So clearly they saw something that just made them think like, wow, he is, he, uh, he, can, he can perform now, it could turn out. That, yeah, no, he's just another – we're going to be talking about him in a few years of in the pantheon of great draft busts. So I think that's what makes it fun, especially when you're not – you know, like myself, I'm not a huge NFL fan. I can kind of distance myself and just sort of see how these guys do and kind of laugh at it in the, yep. in the long run. But, uh, but it's that's a good what, question. That's what makes sports sports, you know. All, it's intriguing and, like, and, and even Stroud versus Bryce Young. Chances are one of them's going to crash out. One of them's going to pan out. We all got our our logic up by, behind each. But um, I think regardless where they are, my take is they took him way too high. Um, and he sucks. Um, people talk about um, him being a good, you know, um, well, you know, going to the NFL and it could be good. And But he, guess what? He just played in the NFL for a full season. He sucked. That's That's my answer. But it's, it's, you know, it, we'll see. We'll see. Time will tell there. Hey, money, money too. He's gonna Absolutely. But yeah, no, I agree. It's such low stakes in the bigger scheme of things. Is that's what makes it fun. It's like, it's not, we're talking sports. Yeah. It's fun. It's right. absolute. You know, <laughs> hey, uh, I want to let Coach Clark kind of, he wanted to, to add something real quick. I want to let you, uh, please feel free to join in real quick. And then uh, we'll slowly start wrapping this up. Yeah. I spent. I looked at the draft a little bit, but every year there's someone that makes a fool of himself. Cock Cleveland. I'm good Detroit. Um, uh, okay. um, uh, every year that just makes a complete dumpster fire of the draft. And then you're going to see, I, I'm kind of hoping that, that, you know, that, you know, Belichick finds his Tom Brady 2.0 or whatever. You know, it's funny because like you're, over the years, they don't think the Patriots had there were a couple of years where they didn't have anyone in the first round. They find some guy that played one year of Ivy League football and three years on lacrosse previously that turns out to be a Pro Bowl caliber whiteout or something like that. You know, that's hey, the magic of it all. That is. Well, I, I actually spent more time watching the XFL than I did the draft. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the DC defenders got something going on with that beer snake. I have one more quick question. What do you think about FSU's chances of uh, getting in the playoffs and maybe competing for a natty? I, I see them as much improved with Jordan Travis at QB. I I am excited to see how they're going to do next season. I think 
last year was uh, was tremendous improvement. That was what I think a lot of no, last year was put a lot of hype back in Knowles fans. You know, Mike Norvell finally got them to be a top ten program. And granted, they had that hiccup in the middle of the season, but they were able to finish off strong, win a bowl game. I think heading into this season, the the hype is going to be there, and I think it, it's going to – it's just – I, you know, it's Florida State. You know, it's a passive fan base. It is a team that fought its way into becoming a blue blood in living memory in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I still consider them that. Because, I mean, before the 80s, before, obviously, Bobby Bowden, they were kind of a no, nobody team, you know. Yeah. And he turned them into something else. And so that that great – behemoth that he created is still there and and it still has its fan base i mean granted and it was interesting too because obviously florida state didn't do particularly great in the draft this year but i wouldn't look at that as a bad thing i know you know florida state fans are like that this is the proof of willie taggart was a terrible coach you know or, or recruiter what we do know is that the team that was a winner is still there for the most part and um, I think they have a strong chance of doing well this season. Now, do they make it all the way to the playoff? That's a, that's a good question. I, I'm always hesitant to, to say that when, you're, when your school name isn't like Georgia or something. But at the same time, you know, we're going to get a real quick test for them again. I still remember. We, I mean, I love the fact that they're playing LSU. That's going to be exciting. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, yeah, that's a big, Last big year was a good game. But this year, I mean, I, holy cow, I can't wait yeah. for it. Jaden Daniels is much going to be even better, you know, in year two under Brian Kelly. You're right. That's, that's a, it's not, and that's the thing, the loser of that game, people are going to look at and be like, well, they're out, they're over. That's one loss against probably at the end of the season, what's going to be the other, the winning team is going to be a top 10 program. You'd figure at the end of the season, but it will be. Whoever loses that, that game this year is not going to get quite as disrespected as they were last year. I think it's going to be much more of a, you know, we'll, they'll need well, at least lose man. one more time. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, man, thanks for joining us. And, you know, um, I'm going to go ahead and slowly wrap this up. We generally like to wrap up around 30 minute mark, but, you know, whatever. It was a good conversation. We had a lot of nice people on. Um, my name is Bob Akairi. This was RCFB Talk 137. Until next week, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. We'll have another conversation next Tuesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. And I'm going to hang up and listen. <laughs>